Throughout history, the men unfortunate enough to have been conscripted into the armies of their leaders have too often been treated as little more than expendable assets to be traded for strategic gains. The commanders sending these men to an almost assured doom, willing to sacrifice as many as was required in the pursuit of their own ends. This callous spending of lives carried out by men who were themselves far detached from any personal risk. Often facing hopeless odds, these soldiers, each one with their own loved ones, ambitions and dreams, was carelessly fed into the meat grinder of battle, their flesh and lives reduced to little more than a raw ingredient in the burning foundry of war. This never-ending conveyor belt of fresh victims, continuing to move forward no matter the human cost. Here are my choices for five of the worst examples of soldiers being used as cannon fodder. Number 5. The Forlorn Hope Upon countless battlefields throughout history, there would often be a brief window of time where both sides had fully deployed, but had yet to engage one another. These two armies that were soon to be locked in a life-or-death struggle, facing off across an empty stretch of land during a momentary period of tranquility and calm that would soon be shattered by the roars of battle and desperate screams of the dying. During this unbearably tense standoff, the majority of the soldiers present would at least have the small comfort of knowing that there was one or more lines of men in front of them, this welcome human shield protecting your fragile flesh from the brunt of the soon-to-be incoming enemy storm of bullets, arrows, spears and swords, yet for an unfortunate few, no such comfort was present. In every battle, somebody has to be on the very front line, the first to engage the fresh and unshaken enemy, and subsequently the first to receive his fire. This doomed band of heroes, who surprisingly were often volunteers, became known as the Forlorn Hope, their title truly fitting when you consider their pitifully slim chances of escaping the fight unscathed. Yet drawn by a desire for increased riches, otherwise unattainable career advancement, and the potential for renown and glory, these desperate gamblers recklessly placed their fate in the hands of chance, willingly taking on the riskiest battlefield role as they charged head-on into a heavily defended position, voluntarily advancing into the enemy's well-prepared kill zone, their bodies reduced to little more than cannon and bullet sponges so that those who came after them might have a greater chance of success. Their broken, still-warm corpses often left carpeting the area around a fortress breach, soon to be stepped upon by their advancing brothers-in-arms. The idea of assigning a select group of soldiers the most dangerous missions is perhaps as old as war itself, with the Romans well known for developing a system whereby legionaries who were first to scale enemy walls during a siege were rewarded with a special silver badge for their heroics, with even the legendary Julius Caesar said to have won such an award while serving as a young officer, a laurel which no doubt assisted in his subsequent meteoric rise to power. In medieval Europe, the infamous German mercenary companies, who so famously waged war across the continent in service of the highest bidder, are also believed to have offered double pay for those who would dare to volunteer to fight on the very front line. The mighty two-handed sword they wielded, used to hack apart otherwise unbreakable blocks of enemy pike formations, carving breaches in the line which could be exploited by the troops behind them, with many no doubt meeting their demise impaled upon the pikes of their foes before their double pay could be collected. During the English Civil War, these detachments of the hopeless chosen were frequently used by both sides of the conflict out of sheer desperation. The cursed men tasked with leading the opening attack of a battle, their chances of surviving to greet a new sunset close to non-existent as they hurled themselves into a wall of pikes and a torrent of musket shot. This expendable wave of troops, entrusted with the most dangerous task of the battle, but also one of the most crucial, the success of their attack potentially tipping the scales in their army's favour. However it would be during the siege-laden conflicts of the Napoleonic Wars that the Forlorn Hope would find its most widespread use. Entrenched behind thick, towering fortifications, protected by rings of cannon and muskets, a lengthy siege to starve out the defenders would otherwise be the only way to avoid a bloodbath, with any brazen, all-out attack likely to be easily repelled with a devastating loss of life. 
To overcome this huge strategic disadvantage, the attacking army drew upon the millennia-old tradition of utilising a detachment of forlorn hope in a final attempt to win back the initiative. As the besieging side's cannons relentlessly poured their fire upon a fortress's mighty defences, there would eventually come a moment when a breach in the towering walls was formed, this narrow chink in the enemy's otherwise impenetrable armour providing the slightest chance at ending the siege if it could just be effectively exploited. An all-out assault on such a narrow gap would prove impractical, the advancing mass of men certain to become easy prey for enemy gunfire and artillery as they swarmed around the tiny breach, their densely packed bodies forming a lethal bottleneck that would almost certainly result in huge casualties. To avert such a disaster, it was decided that a small detachment of perhaps just a few hundred men would stand a far greater chance of successfully exploiting the breach, and although this initial storming party was expected to be all but annihilated during the attack, it was hoped that they might survive long enough to secure some kind of foothold around the breach that could be reinforced by the main attack following on behind them. By sacrificing the men of the Forlorn Hope, hundreds or even thousands more might be saved, the fallen corpses now littering the ground around the breach, having served their purpose by soaking up the worst of the enemy musket fire, cannon shot, and explosive mines, making the job of clearing up whatever enemy forces still remained far more achievable, with many of the defenders stationed around the wall's breach, either killed or rendered less effective, as they would still be recovering and reloading their weapons when the second wave crashed against them. Yet, while it might seem as though finding enough men for such a dangerous and hopeless mission would prove difficult, more often than not there was actually fierce competition for places in a forlorn hope detachment. Men with otherwise little hope of advancement saw Glory One in the forlorn hope as their best chance of raising their station, the officers leading the detachment all but guaranteed a promotion should they survive, while the rank and file men would receive first pick of the conquered settlement's plunder and loot, their courage rewarded with riches, their name draped in renown, like the young Julius Caesar thousands of years before. It's easy for us to gloss over what such an action would have entailed, but for the men recklessly storming into near certain death on the faint promise of promotion, the minutes that followed would be the most horrific and probably last moments of their lives, with the lucky few who might survive, no doubt left with the horrors they witnessed that day permanently seared into their minds. Cast into the jaws of enemy fire, their lives now little more than assets to be traded upon their general's campaign map, the advancing men would have been acutely aware of just how exposed they were, as the full weight of incoming cannon and musket fire crashed into their lines, the fragile flesh of the forlorn hope, the first barrier it encountered. The casualties and carnage inflicted in those first volleys would have been unimaginable, the air filled with the stench of smoke and gunpowder, mixed with the metallic tang of blood and excrement, while the pitiful screams of the injured and dying added to the already deafening roar of battle and threatened to completely overwhelm the senses. As the French soldiers filling the surrounding ramparts poured wave after murderous wave of musket fire, grenades, and artillery into the ranks of the forlorn hope, the small breach in the fortress walls soon filled with a grisly assortment of ruined corpses and severed body parts, the soldiers still alive now forced to stumble and crawl their way over the ever-mounting heaps of the dead and dying, fallen men whom they might have once shared a drink in friendship with. As the Napoleonic Wars dragged on, such horrific scenes would be repeated time and time again, as the men of the Forlorn Hope played a pivotal role in the outcome of some of the war's most historic battles, their blood and sacrifice winning the day in the famous sieges of Badajoz, San Sebastian, and Ciudad Rodrigo, amongst countless others. Number 4. The Siege of Port Arthur What price is worth paying for the accomplishment of a strategic objective? How many lives would you be prepared to sacrifice in the pursuit of victory? Such theoretical questions might seem impossible to answer, however this was exactly the dilemma faced by the Japanese military during the now infamous Siege of Port Arthur 
a conflict that pitted the declining Russian Empire against the ascendant Japanese, and a battle which murderously exposed the obsolescence of 19th century tactics in a world now armed with 20th century weaponry. Amid scenes of endless human waves of Japanese troops charging headlong into the jaws of Russian artillery and machine gun fire, a grim casualty rate of over 40% would be inflicted upon the obedient Japanese imperial forces, the industrial scale slaughter leaving the siege's many battlefields covered with what was described by eyewitnesses as a thick, unbroken mass of corpses. As unconcerned by the plight of his men, the Japanese general carelessly threw their lives away for his own personal glory. The sacrifice of these mere expendable assets, meaningless when stacked against the potential for his own career advancement. The callous disregard for human life that occurred upon the barbed wire covered hills that surrounded the port, a chilling foreshadowing of the horrors that would be unleashed upon the world during the coming First World War just ten years later. As the world entered into the 20th century, the rising power of Japan's expansionist ambitions placed them upon an irreversible collision course with the declining yet still formidable Russian Empire. With both sides keen to take advantage of the rapidly disintegrating Chinese Empire, it was only a matter of time until the competing ambitions escalated into all-out war. Russia had staked the claim over Manchuria with the recent building of the Trans-Siberian Railway, which stretched from Moscow to Vladivostok and passed through Chinese territory, while at the same time strong-arming Beijing into leasing them Port Arthur, a highly strategic ice-free naval base that would allow the Russian fleet year-round access to the Far East. The Japanese seem to have been prepared to accept this growing Russian domination of northern China, no doubt realising that an escalation of tensions with such a dangerous world power could potentially backfire with disastrous consequences. However, in return for such an olive branch, they demanded that the Russians reciprocate by recognising the nearby Korean peninsula as falling firmly within the Japanese sphere of influence. Confident that they could easily sweep aside this small-time Asian power, the Russian government contemptuously dismissed the Japanese bargain, unwilling to place a hard limit on their Far Eastern ambitions, and bow to a nation that they viewed as inferior, with many of Tsar Nicholas II's advisers actively welcoming the prospect of a war, believing that a quick, decisive victory on the battlefield would rally the Russian people behind a monarch who was becoming increasingly unpopular and threatened by discontent and revolutionary movements at home. With the negotiations going nowhere, the Japanese broke off relations on February 6, 1904, launching a sudden surprise nighttime attack upon the Russian fleet docked at Port Arthur just two days later without a formal declaration of war. The port simply could not be allowed to remain in Russian hands. The powerful fleet docked at this precious warm-water naval base enabled Russia to project her power throughout the Far East all year round, securing her ever-tightening grip on northern China and providing a stepping stone to further expansion into Korea, an inevitable move that would bring the Russian Empire to the very doorstep of the Japanese islands. If an amicable compromise could not be achieved, the Japanese resolved to seize not just Korea, but Manchuria too, the vast mineral deposits northern China held, a tempting target for a nation bent on carving out their own empire. It was hoped that this surprise nighttime attack being carried out upon the unsuspecting Russian fleet would deliver a decisive blow that would cripple the Russian navy in Asia, as any reinforcements would have to sail the long and arduous journey halfway round the world from the Baltic Sea, by which time the port itself should have already fallen. Yet despite holding the advantage, the mass torpedo attack failed to finish off the Russian ships, and as day broke the Japanese fleet was taken aback to discover a sizeable Russian naval force still intact, the volleys of fire they unleashed upon sighting the enemy forcing the Japanese to withdraw to a safe distance. With such a potent force blockaded in Port Arthur, the only option left open to the Japanese was an all-out ground attack, with a 150,000 strong force under General Nogai Marasuke making landfall before quickly surrounding the port to begin what they thought would be a short and simple siege. 
However, the hubris and arrogance of the Japanese general would have bloody consequences for nearly half of the men under his command, as five months of bloodshed lay ahead. The common soldiers on the ground forced to pay the price for their leader's willing blindness to the reality of the monumental task that lay ahead. The Russian garrison at Port Arthur had not been idle. In the previous months, they had been busy turning the naval base into a heavily fortified outpost of the empire, a mighty bastion of Russian rule that would project their power and influence across Asia. Trench systems, barbed wire, and electrified fences were covered by overlapping fields of fire from countless machine gun nests and backed up by the latest artillery, the imposing defences snaking their way across the many fortified hills which surrounded the port, strategic high ground that would have to be seized before the port itself could be attacked and occupied. Despite being in possession of intelligence reports, which detailed the full extent of the Russian defences, General Nogai Marisuke's contempt for his Russian opponents was so all-consuming that he was convinced that a conventional frontal assault against the fortified hills would be more than enough to secure victory, confident that the Bushido spirit of his troops would easily win the day against such an inferior foe. Yet for those amongst the Japanese high command with a more grounded perspective, the plan to simply crash waves of men against such formidable defences bordered on insanity and rank incompetence. Such primitive 19th century tactics sure to result in a massive loss of life when pitted against an enemy who was securely entrenched and supported by modern heavy artillery and machine gun fire. Undeterred by such cowardly defeatism, General Nogai ordered that the hills be taken by frontal assault, his men advancing in massive human waves towards the enemy positions where they were soon greeted by withering artillery, rifle and machine gun fire as they struggled up the hills, steep slopes. Using special bamboo wire cutters, the hard-pressed Japanese infantrymen cut their way through jungles of electrified fencing and barbed wire, the charred electrocuted bodies of countless friends and comrades left behind upon the lethal wire as they continued forward. Before the Russians were even in sight, thousands of Japanese soldiers were cut down by the relentless tide of incoming enemy fire the Russian Maxim guns spitting out a storm of 600 rounds per minute, large numbers of which easily found their mark upon the flesh of the enemy, the unrelenting waves of men charging forward, negating the need for precision and aiming. Massive 500-pound shells detonating amongst the tightly packed Japanese ranks added to the apocalyptic carnage, their powerful explosions ripping through flesh and bone with ease, the men fortunate enough to survive the deadly blasts, forced to endure the grim experience of being showered with the blood and gore of men whom just moments earlier were standing by their side. As the fighting wore on, the hill slopes are said to have become so littered with the broken bodies of the fallen that fresh waves of attackers advancing behind were forced to tread upon the still warm corpses of the dead the stench of decay now filling the air, alerting them to the fate that most likely awaited them ahead. Despite mounting casualty rates that would see almost half of all Japanese soldiers either killed or injured, General Nogai would not be deterred, his orders to continue the costly human wave attacks, dooming thousands more of his men to an unnecessary death, as his obedient troops pressed on into the jaws of death, no matter how many of their number were cut down. As the war of attrition raised the butcher's bill even higher, countless scenes of individual heroism on both sides saw minor footholds successfully captured, only to be lost hours later to Russian counterattacks. These meagre scraps of territory trading hands at enormous cost in human lives, the callous disregard for the fate of the ordinary fighting men, a grim harbinger of the Great War, which was now looming on the horizon. With the Russian Baltic fleet sailing ever closer, General Nogai was under intense pressure to capture Port Arthur before these tide-turning reinforcements completed their 18,000-mile journey from Europe. However, as the losses continued to mount with no end in sight, even the general began to realise that the strict samurai spirit of his men would not be enough to overcome machine guns, artillery, and barbed wire. 
Yet just as it seemed as though defeat and humiliation were upon them, the shaken confidence of the Japanese high command was restored, as after enduring weeks of unrelenting slaughter and hardship, all while cut off from supplies and reinforcements, the depleted and exhausted Russian garrison was finally worn down, the port falling to the Japanese in January 1905. After five months of stubborn resistance, the hard-fought victory paid for with the blood and suffering of 57,000 Japanese and 31,000 Russians. A series of decisive Japanese victories followed soon after, a stunning winning streak that culminated in the destruction of the Russian Baltic fleet in May of the same year. This perfect storm of disastrous setbacks, forcing the Russians to abandon their attempts at curtailing Japanese expansion in Asia, and instead sue for peace. Although the peace conference mediated by the US President Theodore Roosevelt saw little territorial gains awarded to the Japanese victors, the crushing defeat they had inflicted upon the Russian Empire sent shockwaves around the world, announcing to all that a new power in the East had risen. Buoyed by their success, the Japanese eagerly pressed on with their policy of imperial expansion in Asia, a path that would drag them into two world wars, while the defeated Russians were left exposed and vulnerable. Their humiliation on the world stage, contributing to the revolution of 1905 and the eventual rise of the Soviet Union, the callous sacrifice of so many men in this little-known corner of China, a bleak glimpse into the horrors that the 20th century had in store for humanity. Number 3. The Boxer Rebellion at the dawn of the 20th century, the capital city of China would be the scene of one of the most unusual battles in history, as a secretive organisation of martial artists known as the Society of the Righteous and Harmonious Fists carried out a violent uprising against the ever-rising tide of foreign influence in China that culminated in a declaration of war against all of the world's great powers, followed by a deadly 55-day-long siege of Beijing's diplomatic quarter that would result in the unbelievable sight of waves of indoctrinated peasants, many of whom had never even seen a foreigner before, willingly charging to an almost certain death, armed with little more than daggers and clubs. This bizarre, cult-like organisation of men genuinely believed that the strange rituals and calisthenic exercises they performed made them invulnerable to the weapons of their hated foreign enemies. However, the modern rifles and machine guns of an eight-nation international army was about to prove them wrong with deadly effect. The massed ranks of these men who would become known as the Boxers, charging without fear against the besieged and outnumbered foreigners, this almost unheard of alliance of otherwise competing great powers, successfully working together to crush the uprising, only to be at each other's throats a mere 15 years later, as the First World War was unleashed upon the planet. The 19th century had been a period of great turmoil and humiliation for China, Centuries of stagnation had left her people vulnerable to the more technologically advanced Western powers and the neighbouring Japanese, a nation which had already accepted the inevitable and recently undergone their own rapid modernisation programme in an attempt to fend off the predatory grasps of the Western imperialists. Failing to heed this lesson, China's outdated military suffered a string of decisive and disastrous defeats against several of the world's great powers, this proud and ancient civilization forced to accept degradingly unequal treaties that gave foreigners special privileges, ceded strategic territory to hostile outsiders, and imposed the presence of Christian missionaries in their lands. These years of unending defeat and decline had left the ruling Qing dynasty close to collapse, and the entire nation on the brink of being completely carved up and colonised, this meddling by strangers from faraway lands, causing immense anger, frustration and resentment amongst the ordinary Chinese people, many of whom blamed their personal suffering, misfortune and poor living conditions on foreign interference. Against such a tense backdrop, it was inevitable that this resentment and ill-feeling would bubble to the surface with violent consequences, and as the 19th century came to a close, private rage coalesced into outright rebellion, as a secret organisation called the Society of the Righteous and Harmonious Fists 
fanned the flames of discontent and led a general uprising against all forms of foreign influence, as well as the Qing government itself, a dynasty they viewed as weak, decadent, and incapable of leading China out of its current predicament. The seductive rhetoric of the righteous and harmonious fists lured huge numbers of discontented peasants into their ranks, this secret society of martial artists now more closely resembling a private army than a private club, a development which no doubt surprised and terrified China's ruling elite. By 1900, this rampaging militia was all but acting with impunity, the enraged mob burning Christian churches and foreign homes, with the violence continually escalating until the outright murder of Chinese Christians, missionaries, and foreigners became a common occurrence. Later known as the Boxers, due to the shadow boxing exercises that made up a part of their training rituals, this cult-like organization of now politically active rebels showed no fear in battle, genuinely believing that their exercise techniques gave them special powers over mere mortal men that would enable them to withstand enemy bullets and absorb physical blows, this belief in their own invulnerability making them a highly dangerous foe. Some of the more diehard members of the group even believed that a divine army of millions would descend from heaven to help them drive out the foreign devils. Armed with such confidence, they were certain that no foe could stand against them. All of the formidable power and modern weaponry of the Westerners counting for nothing when pitted against their supernatural powers. This boxer uprising was initially just as much anti-government as it was anti-foreigner, desiring the total overthrow of the weakened Qing dynasty, in addition to the expulsion of all foreign influence. However, sensing an opportunity in the unfolding crisis, government insiders maneuvered to harness this potent popular force for their own ends, and began efforts to deflect the hostility and rage of the boxers onto a mutually convenient target hoping to save their own skins in the process, and perhaps even emerge from the chaos with renewed strength and stability. Local governors enrolled boxer detachments into their own state militias, the anti-foreign faction now in control of the central government, funneling funds and supplies to the marauding rebels, while at the same time legalizing the movement. This newfound state recognition and support, persuading the boxers to drop their previous opposition to the Qing dynasty, the two sides now joining forces in the pursuit of a shared objective, to throw off the shackles of Western influence and roll back the treaties and privileges that had caused so much humiliation and exploitation. For Chinese Christians and foreigners alike, the writing was now on the wall. On June the 20th, 1900, an army of boxers moved into Beijing and surrounded the city's foreign quarter, which housed hundreds of important diplomats, religious leaders, and businessmen, as well as their families. The very next day, the Chinese empress declared war on all foreign nations with diplomatic ties in China, and ordered the besieged foreigners to vacate the city under escort of the Chinese army within 24 hours, a command which the terrified men, women, and children understandably refused, unwilling to trust the Chinese army's guarantee of safe passage, believing that they would instead be killed instantly. Trapped in their homes and diplomatic compounds with just 900 armed soldiers and a few brick walls separating them from an assured, grisly death at the hands of the boxer militias who could be heard screaming for their blood, the besieged foreigners hunkered down and prepared to fight for their lives, well aware that should their enemies break through, none were likely to be spared. Outraged by this attack on their diplomats and citizens, and no doubt fearing the loss of the lucrative privileges they had extracted in recent decades, the Western powers and Japan formed an unusual alliance of mutual interest, eight of the most powerful nations on earth organizing an international relief force to break the siege and utterly crush the boxers before their uprising could endanger their interests in China. Within just 24 hours, Vice Admiral Edward Hobart Seymour, the commander of the British Navy's China Station, assembled 200 sailors and marines from nearby European, American, and Japanese warships, and prepared to strike back at the Boxer mob, landing his force 75 miles from Beijing. Seymour planned to rapidly advance on the capital using commandeered trains, however at the head of such a meagre force, he had dangerously underestimated the strength of his enemy, 
Ferocious, unrelenting boxer attacks greatly slowed his progress, and as the Chinese army joined in the fray, the hastily arranged relief column was humiliatingly forced to retreat to a nearby abandoned fortress at Tianjin. With their saviors to be now in need of rescue themselves, the foreigners trapped inside Beijing prepared for the worst, resolving to fight to the bitter end no matter the hardships they endured. The various otherwise competing international factions agree to temporarily put aside their differences, pooling their resources and manpower into a single unified defense. However, despite possessing the best training and weaponry the modern world had to offer, this tiny globalized force endured a daily fight for survival against the terrifying fanaticism of their boxer enemies, each morning of the siege threatening to be their last. Like the failed Seymour expedition that had been sent to rescue them, the besieged foreigners trapped inside Beijing were relentlessly assaulted by endless human wave attacks, as unconcerned with their own safety and well-being, Hundreds of boxer rebels armed with nothing more than farm tools, blades, and clubs charged against the coordinated rifle fire of the International Alliance, the few who made it through the volleys of bullets, engaging the Westerners in hand-to-hand -hand combat before being cut down. Displaying no fear of death or injury as they charged towards their doom, these waves of impressionable young men, many of whom were uneducated and came from farming backgrounds, had been indoctrinated by their leaders into believing that their physical training had imbibed them with a power described as the Iron Shirt, the daily rituals they performed effectively transforming their skin into an impenetrable magical barrier that rendered their bodies impervious to bullets and physical blows. One British journalist who witnessed the human wave attacks during the siege described the boxers working themselves up into a hysterical frenzy before charging straight into the foreigner's gunfire, their shirts torn open to expose their bare chests, the soon-to-be bullet-riddled young men, momentarily confident in the knowledge that their mystical abilities would easily get the better of these foreign devils, whom they refer to as the hairy ones. Some even believed that the boxer corpses strewn across the foreign quarter's now blood-soaked streets were merely temporarily disabled and would soon rise again to rejoin the fight, while rogue elements in the boxer leadership had deployed trickery and deception to convince their followers that they could start magical fires that would only burn down the foreigners' housing, a claim that was soon shown to be false as the raging infernos indiscriminately tore through the city turning to ash Chinese and foreign homes alike. As the waves of expendable young men charged towards their demise, several accounts from the foreign soldiers talk of how three or even four rifle bullets fired at point-blank range could be required to stop a single boxer, the frenzy of self-belief they had worked themselves into, carrying them onwards even after the first couple of volleys had pierced their flesh. What the Chinese rebels lacked in firepower was more than made up for by numbers and sheer insane bravery, or perhaps just delusion. The boxer leadership sending the young peasant boys to an early grave, no doubt remaining far behind the front lines, unwilling to test out their claimed magical powers in a real firefight. Despite easily cutting down wave after wave of boxer attackers, the besieged and thinly spread international coalition began to buckle under the weight of their enemy, as each passing day saw their numbers dwindle in the face of such a constant and overwhelming onslaught. With casualties mounting, supplies running dangerously low, and the expedition force sent to relieve them trapped miles away, it seemed as though defeat and extermination was upon them. In fact, their entire position would have already easily been overrun, were it not for the actions of several key Chinese military officials who refused to launch an all-out attack in support of the boxers, this restraint reflecting the fact that key players in the Chinese government were doing their best to avert an all-out war with the Western powers, a conflict which they knew would be ruinous for the Chinese people. Despite the embarrassing failure of the Seymour expedition, the Western powers refused to abandon their citizens and representatives to the boxer mob, quickly assembling a second international force of over 19,000 troops, this far larger and better equipped rescue army capturing Beijing on August 14th, 1900. The arrival of such a powerful foreign presence, easily defeating the Chinese army and boxer rebels, 
the surviving remnants of the once formidable cult quickly melting away into the countryside, with most of the boxers abandoning the group and returning to their farms. The peace treaty that followed secured and expanded the privileges of the Western powers, and forced the Chinese government to hand over a sizable payment in reparations, the entire affair proving to be a costly and disastrous humiliation for the ruling Qing dynasty, which was now left so weakened that it would fall just eleven years later. The actions of the strange Society of the Righteous and Harmonious Fists during the 55 days of the siege, having a lasting impact upon China and the entire world. Number 2. Penal Battalions Stalin once said that quantity has a quality of its own. In the depths of a long war, with manpower running desperately low, why throw away the lives of condemned criminals in a wasteful execution when such men could instead be put to use in service of the greater good, their flesh sacrificed in exchange for a strategic gain, their crimes atoned for with the shedding of their blood? Throughout history this cold, calculating logic has resulted in convicts and other undesirables being exploited as useful but disposable cannon fodder, men of little worth who would not be missed by society, these legions of the damned forced to undertake the most dangerous missions in battle, their ultimate fate decided by a stark choice between a possible death on the front lines or a certain death at the hands of an executioner. As far back as ancient China and the Roman Republic, records exist detailing how criminals, slaves, and even those in financial debt were promised amnesty in exchange for military service, their crimes, misdeeds, and dishonor expunged from the records upon completion of their battlefield penance. These ranks of the otherwise hopeless and condemned, often eager and willing to grasp a chance at redemption, however unlike ordinary rank-and-file soldiers, these undesirable warrior convicts would more often than not be tasked with the kind of missions that would make their eventual reintegration into society highly unlikely, the men standing more chance of receiving a spear through the belly than a future as an ordinary rehabilitated citizen. With Hannibal's invading Carthaginian army rampaging unchecked across Italy, the desperate Roman Senate authorised the enlistment of convicted criminals into the dangerously depleted Roman legions, the need for additional manpower so pressing that the price of pardoning unsavoury and often dangerous criminals was worth paying when pitted against the Republic's very survival against such a dangerous and unpredictable foe. Centuries later, Napoleon would utilize penal units as an effective way to maintain discipline amongst his largely conscripted soldiers, while at the same time bolstering his hard-pressed armies with a ready supply of fresh and otherwise untapped manpower. Prisons across France were emptied of inmates, the men quickly trained, armed, and sent to the front to be offered up to the guns and cannons of the French emperor's many enemies. As news of their grim fate spread throughout the army, ill-disciplined conscripts who might have otherwise deserted or refused to follow orders suddenly fell in line and obeyed their officers, their rotten situation in life no longer seeming so unbearable when presented with the looming threat of a transfer into one of these cursed punishment battalions. Yet it would be during the Second World War that penal battalions were most infamously used by both the German and Soviet armies as hardened criminals, petty thieves, and political dissidents were carelessly thrown into the meat grinder that was the Eastern Front. Prior to the war, the Germans had used specialized penal units as a way to maintain discipline and punish the unruly, placing soldiers deemed to be disruptive in tightly controlled and isolated units before their insolence could spread through the ranks and impact general morale and cohesion. In ordinary times, such a system proved effective, as rule breakers were removed before they could cause trouble, the hard daily routine they faced acting as a powerful deterrent to others. However, as the tide of the Second World War began to turn against Germany, the High Command scoured the Reich's prisons and detention facilities for fresh blood to reinforce the depleted front lines. 
Unlike in earlier years, now even the most hardened criminals were conscripted into the penal battalion's ranks, as bands of thieves, deviants, and murderers were deemed fit to fight and sent into combat in a desperate bid to stave off defeat. The otherwise damned men offered stays of execution, lighter sentences, or even an outright pardon for their obedient service and acts of heroism on the battlefield. By 1945, more than 50,000 convicts are thought to have served in Germany's penal battalions, yet for the condemned who found themselves offered the chance of a clean slate, penance would come at a high price. Life inside the battalions was harsh and unforgiving, the criminals turned soldiers subjected to far worse conditions than ordinary army units, as they found themselves assigned only the most dangerous and back-breaking tasks, all while poorly equipped and supplied. These expendable and unwanted dregs of the Reich, frequently thrown into hopeless battles where their lives might be intentionally sacrificed to buy enough time for regular army units to escape before being overrun, or merely used to soften up heavily defended enemy positions for the regular German soldiers waiting behind them. It would have quickly become apparent that their promised redemption was little more than a dream, the grim reality they now faced likely to see them buried in an unmarked grave in a remote, frozen patch of land somewhere on the vast eastern front. Yet the uncomfortable truth was that the men had little choice in the matter, as any refusal to carry out such doomed missions would result in an immediate execution of their original sentence, which for those men on death row would mean a swift bullet to the back of the head. Only by fighting on might they have the faintest chance at surviving the war. As the ranks of these penal battalions swelled with thousands of thugs, killers, and the criminally insane, the aggression and violence of these dangerously unhinged men was harnessed and unleashed upon enemy soldiers and civilians alike, with the now infamous 36th Grenadier Division of the Waffen-SS weaponizing Germany's most dangerous criminals with unsurprisingly horrific results. This especially sadistic outfit used to conduct a terror campaign upon partisans and civilians in Eastern Europe, the atrocities they carried out even shocking seasoned SS field commanders. Yet the growing size of the German penal battalions was eclipsed by the Soviets, the Red Army estimated to have deployed some 430,000 men in their own formidable yet disturbingly expendable force of convicts, disobedient soldiers, and political prisoners. Stalin's large-scale political purges and paranoid unwillingness to tolerate anyone even suspected of disloyalty had filled the nation's prisons and gulags with perhaps millions of lost souls. However, with the German army now threatening to overrun the entire country, Stalin issued Order No. 227 in July 1942 in a last-ditch desperate attempt to halt the downfall of his empire. Later known as the Not One Step Back Order, this uncompromising directive banned the use of retreat as a military tactic in an effort to restore the Red Army's faltering discipline and halt the crippling spread of panic unleashed by the seemingly unstoppable advance of the Germans. From now on, anyone found to be falling back in the face of the enemy would be either shot on sight or arrested. Coupled with the ongoing purges, this change in military doctrine led to a massive increase in the number of Soviet convicts, most of whom were merely young boys whose courage had understandably waned in the face of the enemy and death. The momentary lapse of discipline amidst the chaos and carnage of battle, forfeiting their freedom and perhaps even their lives. Yet rather than wastefully disposing of these undesirable elements of society in a far-flung gulag, those deemed able-bodied and ready for combat were instead incorporated into the Red Army's rapidly growing legions of penal units, these expendable units of criminals, cowards, and enemies of the state, providing a desperately needed fresh supply of cannon fodder, while at the same time efficiently disposing of prisoners who would otherwise be expensive to feed, shelter, and keep under guard. Their otherwise worthless lives traded for strategic gains on the battlefield. Soviet commanders wasted no time in putting these new assets to use, carelessly sacrificing the men's lives in the pursuit of their objectives. Kept under a constant armed guard, the convict soldiers would usually be deployed where the fighting was fiercest, the potentially rebellious men only given weapons at the very last moment before an attack, 
thrown forward to deliberately trigger enemy ambushes, dozens or even hundreds of men could be cut down in seconds. The intentionally exposed penal soldiers drawing the fire of hidden German troops laying in wait, the bullet mangled corpses revealing the enemy's position to Soviet artillery and mortar fire crews who could wipe them out from a safe distance. In snowy conditions, there were even reports of penal soldiers being dressed in dark uniforms instead of snow camouflage, in an effort to draw enemy fire away from regular Red Army units. In fact, the losses the penal battalions incurred were of such little consequence that in some cases, entire unarmed units of the condemned were ordered to march forward at gunpoint across German minefields, the sacrifice clearing a safe path for regular Red Army troops following behind. Faced with such hopeless odds, retreat and desertion might seem like the most prudent course of action. However, soldiers known as barrier troops were positioned directly behind the deployed convicts. These specialized forces tasked with gunning down any Soviet troops attempting to flee the battlefield. With nowhere to run or hide, the condemned more often than not solemnly advanced forward to a near certain death in the grim knowledge that should they somehow survive this engagement, there were always more battles to be fought, more missions to carry out. While in theory these punishments were supposed to be temporary, more often than not they proved to be tantamount to a death sentence, as although a condemned soldier could theoretically redeem himself through heroic actions or injury in battle, in reality he had already been earmarked for death one way or another. This false hope merely peddled to ensure the men did not enter open revolt, with very few of the nearly half a million men who served in Soviet penal battalions thought to have survived the war. Number 1. The Mongol Human Shields The legendary Genghis Khan was famed for his innate ability to recognize a man's talents and put them to use, caring little for one's birth or social status, instead seeing the raw potential each man held, potential that could be harnessed for his own ends. The Great Khan firmly believed that every man was capable of fulfilling a useful role in the running of his mighty war machine, no matter how minor, even whether it was simply collecting animal dung for use as heating fuel. In the Khan's growing empire, nothing and nobody would be wasted, a use could be found for everyone, all would play their part. However, despite this philosophy sounding enlightened and utilitarian, its implementation was methodically callous as human beings became little more than raw materials to be exploited like dung collected for the fires, or wood fashioned into arrows, an uncountable number of captives from his unrelenting conquests reduced to expendable living shields, driven forward in their thousands to soak up enemy missile fire that might have otherwise found its mark in one of the Khan's precious soldiers. These unfortunate and unwilling tools of conquest crushed in the ever-turning cogs of the Mongol Empire. After uniting the warring nomadic tribes of Mongolia into a single unified force, the Khan led his horsemen out of the steppes to establish what would become the largest land empire in history, the unstoppable military machine he forged, bringing down entire empires in its wake, the many once opulent cities reduced to depopulated ruins. With perhaps no more than 200,000 horsemen at his disposal, the Khan conquered huge swathes of Central Asia and China, his army repeatedly besting enemy forces many times its size, despite the great powers he vanquished having access to near unlimited wealth and manpower. Yet all the gold and soldiers in the world would not be enough to resist the Khan's tactics and strategies, as time and time again he achieved the unthinkable bringing to heel rivals who just years earlier would have considered the Mongols beneath them. The great cities spread across the various Chinese empires were more often than not well fortified behind thick, high walls ringed by deep trenches and moats. Against such mighty defences, these wild nomadic horse archers were rendered all but impotent, the great mobility which was their main strength effectively neutered. This limited access to modern siege equipment threatened to hamper or even halt the progress of the conquest of China, with any all-out assault upon a well-defended city likely to result in massive losses, casualties which such a relatively small horde could ill afford to lose. 
To overcome these dual disadvantages, a wide array of cunning and often abhorrent tactics were utilized by the Mongols to achieve their objectives. The terror they unleashed in their wake often cowing opponents into submission without the need for a costly battle or siege. However, such remarkable feats would come at an enormous cost in human lives and suffering. The unfortunate ordinary people on the receiving end of the conquests, paying a steep price for the Khan's glory and achievements. Settlements that refused to peacefully surrender would be ruthlessly put to the sword, the vengeful Mongol troops carrying out a wholesale extermination of every living thing within its walls, as men, women, children, and even animals were swiftly dispatched, the news of such a terrible massacre spreading fear like a plague through the surrounding area forcing neighbouring populations to think twice before putting up resistance against the foreign invaders. Yet occasionally the Khan would spare a portion of a city's captives from taking their place in the grisly skull pyramids he constructed from the heads of the slain. This gesture performed not out of benevolence and mercy, but for a far more disturbing yet practical purpose. True to the Khan's belief that nothing should be wasted, skilled craftsmen and artisans would usually be transported back to the Mongol camps, where their abilities could be put to use in service of the empire, while the most attractive women of a conquered city would be added to the Khan's personal harem, or handed out to loyal officers. However, even those prisoners who might not have any immediately discernible talents could still be put to use in service of the Mongol people. To help counter the enemy's numerical superiority and formidable fortifications, the Mongols developed a frighteningly simple yet effective strategy that they called Karash, a term which loosely translates as living boards or human shields. Before a new siege or battle began, captives taken from previously conquered settlements would be rounded up in the thousands and driven forward at sword point, the civilian prisoners used as a giant meat shield to soak up enemy fire, their unprotected flesh absorbing thousands of arrows, crossbow bolts, boiling oil, and whatever other weaponry the defenders had at their disposal. The Mongol troops advancing behind this protective wave of captives spared the worst of the hostile barrage, thus enabling them to close with the enemy and breach any siege defences while still relatively fresh and unharmed. These steadily advancing human shields also served a secondary psychological purpose, the defending army or garrison forced to fire upon civilians who were their own countrymen, the devastating effect of mowing down thousands of unarmed men, women and children who could potentially have been family members and friends, no doubt inflicting a shattering blow to morale, the defending soldiers also acutely aware that every arrow absorbed by this sprawling shield of flesh equated to one less Mongol casualty, making their own defeat and death far more likely. Listening in from the comfort of our modern world, it might sound difficult to believe that so many prisoners would obey the Mongol command and march forwards to their own demise, but for the unfortunate captives dragged on to the battlefield, it was a stark choice between an immediate and brutal death at the point of a Mongol sword, or a slight chance at perhaps a few more hours or even days of precious life should they somehow survive, the grim decision compounded by the fact that should you resist, the Mongol soldier tasked with executing you would be unlikely to go out of his way to spare the pain and suffering of an expendable and disobedient prisoner. Marching forwards knowing that they had little more than a zero chance of survival, the unfortunate souls embedded within the human shield would have had to contend with the sickening guilt that their actions were contributing to the demise of their own people, the protective barrier they provided the unscathed Mongol soldiers following behind, making their enemies ultimate victory far more probable. As arrows from their own people rained down around them, the prisoners desperately sought to prolong the arrival of their inevitable death, any faint glimmer of hope still present in their minds, perilously in danger of being extinguished by the cold realisation that even if they miraculously survived this battle, there would be countless more to come in the Khan's never-ending conquests, 
Such sickening scenes would be repeated at the countless battles and sieges fought during the Mongol Empire's lightning expansion, as an untold number of expendable civilians perished in service of the Mongolian masters, the tactic likely to only have fallen out of favour not due to any concern for ethics, but because the Mongols eventually obtained advanced and effective Chinese siege technology which allowed them to breach fortified walls with far greater ease. The trouble of rounding up and herding prisoners in the chaos and heat of battle simply no longer necessary or practical. Yet this tactical shift would not result in any extra lives being spared, as those who would previously have been forced into a human shield were now immediately put to death, along with the rest of a resisting city's population. So those are my choices for five of the worst examples of men being used as cannon fodder. Let me know in the comments which other examples you would have mentioned, and I'll see you again on the next video.